so some of you already had uh, our seminars before. Um, so Caucasus Through Time Network is an inter interdisciplinary research network for early career researchers in the area of the archaeology, anthropology, history, and art history of the Caucasus region. And uh, uh, we are a group of master and PhD students working on the Caucasus. So our group uh, is uh, growing day by day. So we have now uh, 10 members in our committee. And the main aim of, uh, of the network are to try to bring together modern approaches and fresh uh, research and new perspective on the cultural expression of a significant region over time, specifically giving a voice to young scholars and early career researchers. The network is an inclusive and encouraging environment we put strong emphasis on uniting transcending national boundaries and enhancing dialogue and uh, just only also i can uh, i want to mention the network is non-profit making organization and is therefore it has no affiliations or no sponsorships right so now i will go quickly introduce our event program um our First speaker, uh, Lana Chologauri, will be speaking about the bribe, loot, uh, luxury, or diplomatic gifts, ancient and late antiquity silverware from Georgia, which is, I'm very much looking forward to that presentation, Lana. And uh, then uh, uh, we will travel to Azerbaijan, which uh, Jehun Emily will guide us uh, uh, on uh, talking, uh, speaking on cemeteries on the territory of ancient Kabbalah and some remarks on the funeral rites uh, and practices. And uh, our uh, third speaker, Richard Kendall, will guide us through Pontic uh, Step in Antiquity, which he will discuss uh, a king under your control. Um, please forgive me if I am mispronouncing it. So, uh, Far Zoe's and Ines Moise at Olvia. And uh, lastly, we will, uh, perfect, thank you. And lastly, we will offer the platform to Ian Calvin uh, with his uh, fascinating uh, presentation on Lazika Egrisi in late antiquity followed up by Q&A session. And uh, the event will be moderated by Richard Kendall, a PhD researcher from the University of Edinburgh. I will uh, pass to Gwen to introduce Richard. I'm going to briefly int uh, introduce Richard. So Richard, Richard is a PhD student in classics at the University of Edinburgh. And um, he fo focused on the post gatic mid-century, mid-first century BC history of Obia uh, on the northern Black Sea coast. He has degrees in classical archaeology um, from the Ver University College London, the University of Oxford, and the University of Birmingham. Um, and he's also currently co-editing an AHRC-funded collection of conference papers focused on the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic uh, as a member of the Pandemic Pers Perspective Group. Um, so we'll now hand over to you, Richard. Great to be here. Looking forward to a really interesting uh, selection of talks. Um, so the way it's working is uh, there's a talk of roughly 15 minutes. There'll be a QA and a of uh, roughly five minutes, so probably only a question or two. And then after all of the speakers, we'll have a slightly longer uh, Q&A session where, you know, we'll try and build on some of the sort of overarching themes uh, of the papers. And, you know, perhaps if, if you don't sort of get your question in in that first five minute window, you can direct it to a specific speaker then. Uh, let's jump straight into it with um, Lana Chalagari. Uh, she is a PhD student in archaeology at Tbilisi State University in Georgia. Uh, her PhD focuses on silver vessels from the classical period and Lake Antiquity from the territory of Georgia. She was previously at her MA and BA, worked on the cult of Dionysus in the Caucasus and the artifacts related to his cult. She's currently working uh, in Old Tbilisi as an archaeology monitor within the rehabilitation projects in the Old Town for the past three years. And she's also, blimey, uh, working at Tbilisi State University as an invited teacher for the MA course Management of Archaeological Projects. She has taken part in a range of archaeological fieldwork, landscape survey and monitoring, and she's a member of the projects Persia and its Neighbours with archaeological fieldwork in the Caucasus, Iran and the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Lana, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I should ask Gwen to 
and my presentation for your introduction, Richard, and uh, thanks again for, for your invitation to join this workshop. It's a pleasure and it's nice to meet all of you and hopefully we'll meet in person one day. So uh, today's presentation is, um, is a, like a very, very short summary of my PhD uh, research, which is focused on the silver vessels from antiquity, but I don't aim to study each individual piece and I don't describe uh, each of them. I just try to study the correspondence between the silver vessels and the political and economic activities in the region, in the Caucasus. So, um, uh, in, I will just shortly tell you the importance of the silver vessels in antiquity, uh, and uh, then I will uh, show you the, the next slide. So, okay, can we go to next next slide? So, as you know, the precious metal objects was always um, very important for the society. It was, um, let's say, the symbol of the power and authority of the owner. And uh, from uh, the classical period um, up to the like Middle Ages, uh, rich families, local elites, they owned these um, silver vessels, like precious metal tableware. And it has such a big importance that sometimes if they went to the uh, like military campaigns or changing the uh, place for, for a short time, they used to uh, carry their belongings with them. So the silver vessels uh, val val value was really high, uh, but it was also used as a, its um, basic value was a bullion. And um, uh, sometimes we have uh, inscriptions punched underneath of the vessels, uh, like it's a weight inscriptions and it could be converted in cash anytime. So uh, uh, this uh, silver vessels is mainly connected with the, uh, uh, how to say, the trade, diplomatic and uh, economic relations, uh, relations with different nations. Um, and uh, the very important value of the silver vessels is also the, um, that uh, it, it's, uh, it had a diplomatic value. So emperors and the kings used to send this silver vessels to the to to the rulers of the lands they conquered or they aimed to subject. Uh, next, please. Um. Okay, so uh, I will just uh, briefly tell you about the, the silver vessels, first silver vessels that, that appears in the territory of Georgia. These are silver stidula, silver goblet uh, with decorations and with the plain surface. They were discovered in a triality, bar, triality culture burrows, which belong to the um, like leaders of these ethnic groups. These uh, silver vessels are uh, considered to be made locally, but with some uh, influence, with with influence uh, from the Near East, uh, we I, I don't I'm not going to speak uh, in a very much details. But uh, what I want to say is that during the late third or early uh, second millennium BC, we can see that there was really deep uh, social uh, hierarchy and differentiation uh, in in the local society in the Caucasus. Uh, next, please. Uh, situation is changing during the next following period. This is the late Bronze and Iron Age from 15th century BC up to the 7th century BC. And we can see that uh, silver or precious metal vessels like gold or silver, they disappear for some time. How, how it can be explained? Uh, there could be like several explanations of this uh, uh, fact, but I think a um, widely adopted version is that silver mining was kind of interrupted during the Dark Ages, and then it was reintroduced by Phoenicians in the, from the seventh century BC. So this could uh, uh, be like the reason why it disappeared from the Caucasus too. But uh, uh, also we can see that this is very. Um, there is very intense uh, production of the bronze uh, bronze objects and iron objects in Georgia, in the territory of Georgia. And we can see some of the, uh, we have discoveries of some bronze vessels, but uh, we don't have any uh, made of uh, silver or, or, or the gold. Uh, how can this fact, uh, fact uh, be explained? Uh, of course, there is always the possibility that there were, were some precious metal vessels uh, made during this period, but they are not uh, yet discovered. Or there is another possibility that these vessels could be melt, remelted and reused to make 
make some more fashionable goods uh, and etc. But uh, what we can say that um, during this uh, period, um, we, we do not have any silver production uh, and uh, silver vessels reappear in the territory of Georgia from the 5th century BC. Uh, can, can you show the next slide? So um, uh, late 6th, early 5th century is the beginning of uh, so-called early antiquity, according to the Georgian chronological term. Um, and it's uh, up to the like 1st century BC. Uh, and I will show, show you the distribution of the silver vessels. Uh, the highest concentration during classical period comes uh, from like 13 different locations and they're located as in West Georgia, uh, in Colchis, as well as in Iberia. Uh, they're mainly, uh, these discoveries are mainly concentrated in the Plexi coastline area or uh, in the mountainous area. And this can be explained for some reasons too. I will talk about it later. Um, can, can, next slide, please. Uh, these uh, silver vessels are uh, ma mainly discovered in the rich burials, uh, and they are mainly uh, located in Vani archaeological site, that, uh, which was administrative center uh, of Colchis during classical period. But they are also found as a in a context of hordes uh, from like Sairhet, Asvegia, Halbori, Anchaiti, and like several locations. Next, please. Um, uh, I made some statistics to show you the um, uh, these silver vessels from classical period. There are uh, totally 42 pieces discovered, and majority of these vessels are fiala, fiala, um, like you know these uh, white balls. Uh, mainly, they belong to the Achaemenid uh, Toreltic group, but we have uh, some from the Greek world. Next, please. Um, uh, I'll, this, on this slide, you can see that silver vessels. On the left side, there is Wani archaeological site, and Wani was very much influenced by the Greek world and during the Greek colonization process. So majority of the Greek shape uh, vessels uh, we have found in Wani and Pichunari archaeological site, which is also like Greek uh, police um, is, um, established on the Black Sea coastline. Uh, but we have some of Achaemenitor from East Georgia as well as from uh, from the West. Next slide. Uh, so this is a group of the of the vessels uh, of fialis. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly. It has like fialai. Um, this is a group of uh, um, Achaemenid Toreltics, and um, it is very important how they appeared in the territory of Georgia. I will show you more uh, details about these vessels on the next slide. Um, as uh, you can see, next slide. Yeah, on this slide, you can see most of the silver fill uh, discovered in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, can you go back? Uh, yes, thank you. So these fialas, you can see that there is different shapes and different ornamentations, and they are uh, identified to be Achaem import from Achaemenid world, import from the Greek world, but also locally produced, like local imitations. And it's considered that uh, in Georgia, there must have been at least one provincial uh, uh, workshop of the Achaemenid empire. Now, some of them are uh, found, um, some of them are um, like, uh, where, uh, appeared in different locations as a result of plunder. For instance, this uh, silver vessels on the uh, silver uh, bowl on the left corner, on the down left corner, which um, has inscription on, on the base, and it says that it belonged to the Apollo temple that located in Fazis, in Colchis. Uh, and uh, it was found in the Kuban region in North Caucasia, uh, in one of the Sarmatian graves. So we see that uh, the silver vessels are spread uh, really widely, in, and we, we have found lots of finds from Northern Caucasus, because we know that uh, nomad peoples, uh, after the nomad invasions in the south, they robbed the cities, they, they took all the luxury, and uh, that's why we have many uh, of the discoveries in the north. Next slide. 
So to uh, speak about this situation, political situation in the region, we should uh, say that um, it is a period of the Greek colonization process in the um, uh, in the West Georgia and uh, in, in the West, and uh, also rise of the Achaemenid Empire in the East. Uh, what we know about Georgia, like we mainly discuss about um, this political situation according based on the archaeological data because we don't have much of the written sources uh, speaking about Colchis and Georgia's political situation. We know that uh, Greeks uh, established three Greek colonies along the Plexi coastline and that uh, Greek uh, culture spreads uh, in the territory of Georgia through the Plexi coastline. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there was a strong political union uh, in, in the West Georgia, and it was Kingdom of uh, Colchis, uh, which was ruled by local king, and they had their local money emission too. But what is happening in the East Georgia is that we do not have much of a like strong political unit. The Kingdom of Iberia is not formed yet. But according to the written sources, we know that some part of the East Georgia was uh, included in the uh, 18th and 19th satrapies of the Achaemenid Empire. So they were more uh, dependent on the, on the Persia politically than in the in the than the West Georgia. But according to the Herodotus, we know that uh, you know, Colchian kings like from West Georgia, they used to send, uh, they didn't pay tribute, but they used to send some, like it was 100 girls and 100 boys per each to the Persia. So we see the situation that um, a local elite, local rulers try to have good relations with uh, Persians as well as with Greeks. I think they really benefited from uh, this trade uh, and uh, economic relations uh, with both like both rich commonwealths like Greek and uh, Persian. But we should also note that uh, really important trade economic roads crossed the Caucasian Mount, uh, Caucasia. And uh, also uh, Georgia's location in the central Caucasus is very uh, strategic and uh, important because the West and East Georgian rulers were um, controlling the really important North Caucasian pathways. And uh, they could control, they could storm at these nomads, people like nomad invasions, because uh, these nomads living beyond the Caucasian mountain was one of the greatest dangers of the empires as uh, it was danger for Rome, for um, Achaemenid Empire, for Sasanians and etc. Uh, can I go to the next slide? So these are the, uh, the uh, pictures of the local uh, money which is made of silver and this is uh, it's called Colchian Tetri. Uh, this money was like really widely spread in uh, West Georgia also in the North Caucasus and it corresponds to the um, existence of the Kingdom of Colchis from 6th century uh, till the beginning of 3rd century BC but then we see some decline um, of this uh, Colchian Kingdom. Next please. So when we speak about uh, silver production in uh, in the territory of Georgia, and when we see that they they could produce some silver coins, we we think uh, we can say that they could uh, mine the silver, so they had the raw material to produce some of the vessels locally. But mainly, it must have been like um, import from the different empires. Next, please. So the uh, following period is a Hellenistic period. Uh, this is the period when um, Georgia, like, um, uh, sorry, it was just, uh, this is a period when uh, the Kingdom of Colchis was divided into small polities political unions. It was kind of decline of the empire. Uh, it was also the period when in the East Georgia, uh, Kingdom of uh, Iberia was formed and uh, they uh, spread their, they expanded their territories towards the uh, West Georgia and also they um, uh, they had a big influence on, on the Colchian culture. So, so uh, can you uh, press next? Uh, and also, um, 
we can yeah thank you so um uh, during the second century bc the kingdom of iberia is very um let's say strong political union they control the north caucasian passes but uh, the um, uh, we can say that um there is not at least one uh, discovery of the uh, gold or the silver vessels from Georgia during the Hellenistic period. And uh, this fact, um, I explained that it was a period of really uh, rough political picture in the region. Uh, there were, especially during the second, first century BC, when uh, there was battles between Rome and uh, the Kingdom of Pontus, which heavily affected as uh, Iberia as well as uh, Colchis. So uh, there is uh, another uh, explanation of this disappearance of the silver vessels. Uh, maybe there was a tendency to bury these uh, vessels um, with the deceased, or maybe they were reused and remelted, or maybe uh, silver production was interrupted. They didn't uh, uh, import uh, in Georgia uh, as a result uh, uh, of trade or the result of diplomacy, but um, it, we see that like kind of decline um, of the silver vessel production. So the following period is late antiquity, and it's first uh, fourth century AD. It's Georgian chronological frame, let's say, because uh, from the first century mid Middle Ages uh, start in Georgia. And this is a period when there is the highest concentration of the silver vessels discovered uh, in the territory of Georgia. They are found in 22 different locations and they are uh, mainly uh, found in the rich burials. Next, please. Uh, and these rich burials are uh, usually uh, in, on the uh, Baginetti and Armazis heavy uh, archaeological site, which was royal residence and the necropolis of Iberian mm -hmm. kings. Uh, next, on this, uh, you, you can see some of them. Yeah, so you can see some of these rich burials, which was full of silver vessels. But uh, I should um, I should mention that it's some of these graves. We have a mixture of of the artifacts coming from the Roman Empire as well as from the from Parthia and from Persia. It's coins, the glyptic materials, it's the vessels, like torotics and other uh, objects. So it's we see that there is kind of mixture. Uh, of of the the fine skin. Next, please. So I will just uh, slowly show you some of the slides with these vessels. For instance, this slide shows you that uh, vessels which were, were discovered in the royal necropolis, and this could be direct imperial gifts uh, to Iberian kings from the Roman Empire and Sasanian Empire. They depict like portrait of Marcus Aurelius, Antinous, like possibly Emperor Hadrian, and etc. And um, they also have inscription that some of these vessels were uh, sent to the dedicated to the kings uh, of Iberia. Next, please. Uh, next few slides are like the classification of the bowl. So you can go slowly, change slowly the slides, and it will show you the different types and shapes of the of the vessels. Next. So we have pitchers and uh, cups, as well as spoons and ladles on the next slide. Uh, and jars, so really uh, like um, ve very different uh, vessels, but next. Again, so you can see some spoons, and they're mainly uh, they mainly belong to the Roman uh, torotics. Uh, on this slide, you can see the group of the vessels, which are considered to be locally made. And a very important detail on these vessels is that there is depicted horse, and in front of the Zoroastrian altar, and in some of the vessels, horse is just still standing in front of these altars. While one of them horse is kind of kicking the altar, which is in his vertical in its vertical shape, and on one of these um, vessels, you can see that horse 
kick the altar and altar the Zoroastrian altar is also already moved from its vertical pos uh, position and this could be a reflection of uh, Georgia's political course in politics with that Georgia took pro-Roman course in politics and they declared Christianity as a state religious of the country while there was still really a strong Sasanian influence in Iberia. Uh, uh, next slide. Um, so on the next slide, I think I put some Sasanian silver vessels, uh, which are found in different locations, but these are very important and they, they mainly belong to the period when Sasanians first appeared on the political arena and they first uh, appeared in the territory of Georgia. Uh, this, some of these vessels are really important because they have portraits of the Sasanian kings and their families. And uh, these vessels, um, I, I assume uh, are sent uh, from Sasanian kings to Iberian elite, like Iberian rulers. Uh, in uh, terms of like having, uh, trying to have a good relations with Iberia. And on the next slide, uh, I show the statistic that there are like 132 pieces in total found uh, of the silverware and the majority, like almost 90% belongs to the, uh, they have Roman provenance when there is only 6% of the Sustanian and 5% of the local production. Uh, next slide. Um, so we, we can see that there is really high concentration of the silverware in uh, late antiquity and how it corresponds to the political activities in the region. So we know that uh, uh, during the uh, Roman imperial times, they established four uh, Roman forts along the Black Sea coastline, like on the territory of Colchis, in terms to uh, pre protect empire from the nomad invasions from the North Caucasians. Uh, got enhanced. So um, Roman control, Romans controlled the Black Sea coastline area. Um, can you press next? Um, while uh, uh, in Iberia, uh, there is Kingdom of Iberia, which was very strong politically independent power. Uh, but uh, we can see the picture that um, the Romans as well as Sasanians really try hard to have uh, good relations with the local rulers, uh, are they Iberian or the uh, West Georgian rulers? So um, these silver vessels kind of tell us the story that how intense these relations with Iberian, like Georgians and Persians with and Romans was. So uh, Roman uh, emperors maybe sent this. Um, uh, let's say bribe to local kings uh, to have the that they favor and to protect North Caucasian pathways. Uh, but um, on the other hand, we, we can see that uh, in West Georgia, uh, they do not, uh, didn't have, much, Romans didn't have much control, political control. Uh, so they needed really strong ally to, uh, in, in the hinterland of Colchis to uh, protect this Caucasian path. So uh, this is a, a second century AD is a period when uh, it starts like kingdom of Laziga forms and the La Lazi people subjected other political units and they formed the kingdom of Laziga, which becomes really strong from the third century. Uh, and we can see that Romans didn't show any resistance to this fact that there was strong political unit formed in the territory of Georgia. And uh, it, it, it can be explained that they really needed to have more power in the Caucasus. So they needed Laziga in the beginning as an ally in the Colchian hinterland. So um, if we go uh, on the next slide, um, I'll show another statistics, I think. Um, 
yeah this is um you can go you can change the slides you can go next it shows really really uh, a complex political picture in the region and on this slide you can see this uh, concentration of the silver vessels in georgia and we can see the largest amount of the silverware appears in georgia during a classical period and during late antiquity and this is the period uh, these periods are um, uh, why do we have this uh, highest concentration of these luxurious objects why was there this really big demand from the society during these times and this can be explained that uh, the most of the vessels appear in georgia as a result of trade with these commonwealths or uh, as a diplomatic relations with the greek world roman world achaemenid or the sasanian world so this is, this happens uh, um, in, in during classical period and during uh, late antiquity. So I mainly uh, relate silver vessels with this, uh, let's say, outer uh, contacts with the Georgia. And uh, uh, it, uh, for me, silver vessels is a really important group of the archaeological material that can uh, speak about these political events and economic situation in the region. Uh, it, it, we can also on the next slide there is like small conclusions conclusions and in the small conclusions i say that uh yes there was um another chart and uh yeah and according to these conclusions i can say that yeah there, there may have been some uh, local production of the silverware but uh, compared to their import it was really uh like uh, uh, really small and uh, that uh, silverware is a direct uh, evidence of Colchis and Iberia's political economic relations with Greek world, uh, Persian, Parthian, and Roman empires. And that uh, the silver vessels and their discoveries, uh, they highlight uh, uh, Iberia's and Colchis uh, importance during antiquity. Mm. And I, I think that that's mainly it. And of course, uh, this trade economic growth and silk road uh, was the result, was, was the reason why this uh, lots of imports appear in the territory of Georgia. And um, thank you for attention. Sorry, it took more than 15 minutes. Okay, thank you for a fascinating talk. That was really interesting. I, I know very little about uh, silver imports well, anywhere in the Black Sea region at that time, particularly in uh, Colchis, Iberia. Um, well, oh, I already see a question has gone up from Joanne. Uh, Joanne, would you like to come on the microphone or the video, or would you like to type your no. question in? Yep. No, no, I, I, um, I will okay. come in. Um, all right, I have um, an interesting insight to give you on what's going on with these vessels. Um, it's interesting that they're in periods when you have Persians running about, um, and Already in the Achaemenid period, they are celebrating the festivals of Nowruz and Mifragan, and those are occasions in which tribute comes in. Um, and what you do when the tribute comes in is that you give counter gifts. And the counter gifts are specifically in the form of plates and ewers and cups that were used actually to celebrate the festivals with the ambassadors who came in. So anyway, that's an, uh, the these things are, are recognizable. What's interesting is that the Romans are are getting into the into the picture. They're they're just moving in and saying, okay, fine, you know, we give you these counter gifts when you when you come in, or we send you counter gifts um, when you send us uh, your tribute. The gold and I mean the silver coins with the bull and the lion on them. That's a mark of the of the tribute coins that were paid in the Achaemenid Empire elsewhere in the empire. So in other words, you have this, it's a sort of trade uh, in a way, but it's sort of gifts and counter gifts going back and forth um, yeah. that are connected to Zoroastrian or actually they're pre-Zoroastrian festivals. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's re really interesting. And uh, thank you for, for this comment. I, I would like to have more information. Maybe I will contact you later if it's okay. Anyone has any uh, other burning questions just at this moment? I think we might uh, go straight into Jehan's talk. Uh, unless I'm not seeing anyone uh, put a hand up, but uh, think on that. Obviously, as I say, we'll come back to a, a more general Q&A later after all of the talks. Um, but thank you very much, Lana. Really interesting paper. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Jehan Aminli, uh, who is a leading scientific researcher of the Institute of Archaeology, Ethnography and Anthropology at the National Academy of Sciences in Azerbaijan. Uh, since 2010, he's been conducting archaeological excavations in Gabala, uh, northwestern part of Azerbaijan. Uh, he is also head of the Azerbaijan American Joint Expedition, which has been carrying out excavations in the southern region of Azerbaijan. Uh, his main scientific research interest is the study of monuments dating back to the 4th century BC to the 3rd century AD. And today he's going to be talking about some of the cemeteries on the territory of ancient Gabala and some of the remarks on the funeral rites and practices. Take it away, Jehan. Towns and settlements of Albania uh, mentioned in classical written sources can be associated with specific places. However, fortunately, the main town in natural history, the work of Pliny the Elder, Kabalaka, as well as in the geography of Claudius Ptolemy, Kabala, give promising evidence to equate the eponymous towns uh, with Kabala in the territory of the region of the same uh, name. For many years, archaeological research has been carried out on the territory of Kabbalah, which as a result, settlements and cemeteries have been discovered. In my presentation, I will introduce burial sites dating back uh, between the first century BC, second and third centuries AD. The presentation includes the results of archaeological excavations under my um, guidance in recent years. In addition to the presentation also includes studies from past years for a general overview, as well as some examples from joint Azerbaijan-Korean research carried out at Salbir site. Uh, generally studied uh, burials um, at first sites, synchronous in chronology, but uh, with some differences in the type of grace and funeral rites. Here you can see the sites um, where the cemeteries found at the village uh, Bushlar, village Chur Gabela, Salbir site, Willis Sultan Luka, Kaferli, and Uzuntala sites. Despite the fact that since the first century BC, there are many settlements and cemeteries around Gabala, it is difficult to find them close to each other in the complex. As an example, in the village of Gushla, we discovered a cemetery of the end of the first century BC and the first centuries of our era, but its settlement has not yet been discovered, or vice versa. On the territory of Chakkalı, covering the period of Kabbalah from the 4th century BC to the 1st century AD, despite the fact that the remains of large structures were found, with the exceptions of single graves, no cemetery was found on the territory. However, not far from the territory of Chakkalı, uh, which we suppose antique city of Kabbalah, in the territories of Selbir, Uzuntalı and Gaferli, both uh, a settlement and the cemetery were identified. Salbir site is uh, located on a high plateau between two rivers. At the lowest uh, level in the multi-layered settlement of Salbir, the remains of dwellings and graves dating back to the end of the first century BC and uh, second, third century AD were studied. In the case of the investigated more than 50 catacomb graves, the destruction of settlement of the same period is not traced. On the territory of Uzuntala and Gaferli, located not far from Selbir and Chakkalı, both settlements and cemeteries were identified. An interesting fact is that all these areas are separated from each other by uh, moods that feed on the forest streams. As a result of the study, the traces of the settlement uh, were revealed in the central part of the site, and cemeteries were identified closer to the western modes. In addition, at one of the sites, Uzuntala, during the research in the Soviet period, the column bases and roof tiles of the antique period were discovered. In general, around the territory of Gabala, including the areas of Salbir, Uzuntala, and Gaferli, jar burials, uh, basin graves, burials in tile lined graves, uh, catacombs, pit graves, simple earthen graves with a semi-flexed or strongly flexed position of the dead have been studied. Now let's, uh, uh, let's look at the graves found in these territories. Along with single graves, such as jar burials, simple earthen and pit graves, tile land graves, uh, many catacomb burials have been discovered in the territory of Selbir uh, in recent years of excavations. 
Catacombs found at the depths of two, four meters are mostly domed and have oval shaped chamber. In all catacomb burials were followed single information laid on their left or right side in a contracted position, as well as the instability of the direction of the entrance to the catacomb, there are differences in the position of the skeletons in them. So some skeletons are located head to the west, legs to the east, others um, head to the southeast, legs to the uh, northwest. Ceramic vessels and jewelry are typical for all catacombs. Some catacombs contain weapons, imported glass vessels, fibula, and pious amulets. An interesting point is that catacombs um, predominate in compact in the western part of the territory of Salbir, but tile-lined graves predominate in the southwestern outskirts of the site. In the cemetery of Bushlar, there were identified two types of burials jar burials and earthen graves. So far, only children have been found in jar burials, but in earthen graves, there are traced children and adults. Also, the skeletons in the earthen graves were both in a semi or strongly contracted position. Their direction was the same. Uzuntala Cemetery. Also, back in the 1980s, archaeological excavations were carried out on this territory as a result of which the column base and roof tiles of the ancient period were found, an interest to the next research have been formed with the accidental found of the bronze helmet in 2009. Unfortunately, the excavations at the cemetery were uh, then postponed. And in 2014, there were investigated uh, seven burials, which one of them was jar burial, the others earthen graves. It should be noted that the cemetery itself is quite interesting for its burials. Three of seven graves were double burials. All the graves are rich of um, burial assemblage. Even in terms of the amount of grave goods, the chambers differ in size. Human information uh, in the graves were traced, positioning head to the north and west, way to the south uh, east. The front, uh, in, line, in one line, the head and the legs of the skeleton are surrounded by the ceramic uh, vessels. The light and dark fabric vessels were put into graves in a disordered consequence. A similar case can be traced at Gafferli uh, site, locating, locating in the neighboring Uzuntala territory to the west. During 2020-2021, our expedition explored the graves at, at the Gafferli site. The earthen burials with information in a tightly contracted position and semi-contracted position were uh, studied. In the graves with the semi-contracted information, the alignment system of vessels are identical with Uzuntala burials. In some cases, the destruction of graves with information of semi-contracted uh, position by, uh, by graves with tightly contracted burials can be traced. The identity is followed not only uh, in alignment system of the vessels, but also in the shape of them. In the burial practice, more precisely in the burial inventory of uh, the Uzuntala uh, and Gaperli cemeteries, one moment attracts special attention. So in the graves of Gaperli, vessels conventionally named by us carved out uh, of stone vessels are traced. The stone vessels are of two types, such as deep uh, and shallow bowls. All the bowls have pedestal stand arranged with cylindric foot um, and flaring base. Stone vessels belong to the semi-contracted barrels. Only in one burial, the ceramic imitation of stone vessel, uh, stone vessel shape was found. This vessel is uh, identical. This vessel is identical with its color and the weight. Probably has a substitute purpose. What attracts attention is what purpose as a vessel or mortar, incense burner or altar. These samples were used. 
Stone altars, both in chronology and in a large geographical area, are found in the religious ideology and in burial practice of many nations. Perhaps this small element in the burial of the inhabitants of uh, Gaparli played not only as a grave goods, but also had this ritual significance. Unlike Gaferli, in Uzuntala burial assemblage, the ceramic vessels with inventionally made holes attract attention. This is observed uh, in five of the seven found graves. I would like to present several graves as an example. For example, this, this uh, sixth grave, uh, which I can uh, consider earlier. The grave was found at the depths um, of 155 centimeters. Um, the size of the grave is 90 to 200, uh, 200 centimeters, um, northwest, southeast. Below the knees was jar with hole in the center of the base and was placed upside down. A similar context can be traced in the grave number seven. The ceramic vessel with intentional made holes were also uh, traced in front or behind the skull. For example, you can see the grave number uh, three. The grave differs in size and richness of uh, inventory. The skeleton is in the center uh, of the grave, mm, is one of the right side. Its legs uh, bent from the knees, arms bent from the elbow, hands rise toward the head. Uh, beside the central information, another human death was buried in the grave in the opposite direction. Four um, skeletons were found below the feet of the central desk. Two of the animals are on the right side, the other two uh, on the left. Their heads cut from the neck were put on their bodies. A number of small animal bones were also found under and inside the vessels. The vessels were put in front, above and below of the central human skeletons. Here, we can trace the vessel in front of the skull with perforated hole in the center of the base. This detail of the funeral rite in another version can be traced in this burial, uh, in this uh, cemetery, as well as in other burial uh, burials. For example, the oasis um, with a broken off stem and upside down position were traced in grave number five uh, in Uzuntala Cemetery and grave number three in Bushla Cemetery, probably had the same purpose. We can also include the vessels found in uh, catacomb number one at Selby size to this principle. Here, two same vessels were broken on the uh, body part. In these catacombs, there is a fascinating moment in which the remains of the human skeleton were not found here. However, some inventories are encountered in a pair of numbers, such as buckles, fibula, and also two vessels with a hole, gives us a reason to come to the result because the grave of the Kenataf uh, was intended for double burial. Shapes of the vessels with the holes are different, but all uh, are dark fabric vessels. The specific detail of the funeral rite, which is of a particular nature, has been episodically traced in the territory of Azerbaijan since Bronze Age and continued to exist until the late antiquity, in the antique period. This detail of the funeral rite of Caucasian Albania finds analogies in the burial monuments of Dagestan of contemporary and later time. It allows us to talk of the existence of a ritual uh, that was carried out during the funeral ceremony and reflected some religious ideas associated with the funeral ideology. We suppose that these vessels should, according to uh, prevailing beliefs, symbolize the exodus of the soul of the deceased and have no connection with the custom of damage to the inventory. Also, the graves are aware in forms and types. Burial uh, inventory in the main ceramic vessels are almost identical. In the burial um, inventory, materials of Roman import or under the influence of Roman word are also um, traced. 
In conclusion, I would like to note that so much rarity in the burials of Kabbalah within the studied period gives a reason to think about ethnic diversity in the region. However, given the difficult of grouping the graves by ethnic diversity, I restrict my focusing to local distinctive elements of the cemeteries. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, uh, Dr. Emily. Uh, that was a really interesting talk and sort of a lot of uh, conclusions, a lot of kind of things you can base that from, uh, kind of arguments to be made, as you say at the end there, of, you know, ethnic diversity and the, the imports and whatnot. Uh, does anyone have any uh, questions straight off the bat? Oh, and again, actually, there we go. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll cede to okay. you. This is very quick, and I'm going to have to dip, dip, dip out because I have another lecture I have to go to. But but uh, the conventional interpretation of the hole in the vessel is that things that are are intact um, on the earth can be made intact in the netherworld by putting a hole in them. In other words, you sort of send them along with the person so they can they become usable to the person. I mean, I, I, I love your, your soul coming out business, but the, I'm just telling you the conventional interpretation is that, that it's to make it available for the use of the dead in the, in the other world. So anyway, that's just, I'm sure you knew that, but uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry, you mean the, um, not for the uh, soul, or they use the, this uh, vessel, um, okay, the conventional interpretation, and they exist actually all over the world, you have them, is that they make it possible for the dead to use the implement in the other world. It's sort of like sending it down. It's like sort of killing it in some way and sending it down with the dead. So, I mean, that's just, as I said, a conventional interpretation. I'm not, I'm not denying yours. I love it. I think it's really interesting. Um, but I'm just telling you that there is also another suggestion possibility for why they're doing this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, Laura, have, did you put your hand up? Yeah, so I have a question about the um, the Kamparanda from Dagestan, Jehun. Um, and are those also from the same period? Where are those from? What are the sort of context of the Dagestani parallels that you mentioned? Lara? Hello. Can you can you repeat, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, what? Where are the Dagestan vessels from that you mentioned? You said they're parallels also from Dagestan to the with the holes. Which which? What types of sites or what types of cemeteries are those from? Um, this 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 type uh, of vessels found uh, in the mountains part of Dagestan. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the uh, yes, mountains part of the Dagestan. Mm. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, we, we also have a question in the chat from David. Um, I'll, I'll just read it out, maybe a uh, microphone. But uh, what is the range of dates uh, that are thought to be involved here? Uh, range uh, the, the dating um, this starts from the end of first centuries BC and uh, until the uh, mid of third centuries. Thank you. Thanks. Hopefully, uh, I don't know if David wants to come back in on that. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, so uh, I... Uh, um, so thank you very much for the organizers. Thank you for my introduction earlier. Uh, it was, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't improve upon it, so I didn't do it again. Um, let's, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, Fazois and his Mios at Olbia Pontica. And Olbia is not in the Caucasus. In fact, it's a very long way away. Uh, it's situated at the confluence of the Suvenburg and Dnieper rivers. Um, Olbia is actually a hundred kilometers northeast of Odessa, uh, and consequently about a thousand more to Tbilisi. With this in mind, it would not be remiss of you to ask what a paper on this polis, first settled most likely in the Archaic period by Ionian Greeks from Miletus and occupied until the start of the 5th century AD, is doing in a conference on the region. 
Do I have a grand new interpretation of the geographical boundaries of the Caucasus, or am I simply very much out of place? Well, neither of these hopefully is the case. For while Olbia remains very much not a part of the Caucasus, in this paper I wish to challenge some of the assumptions often made about the networks of the ancient world, and particularly the relationship of Greek cities with so-called migrations of peoples from the east. I will attempt to do this through an extended analysis of the coins of two figures of the second half of the first century AD, Phazois and Ismios, about whom we know nothing save what we can glean from these issues and the results of archaeological excavation. Despite the limited nature of this evidence, I nevertheless feel that some important observations have gone previously unremarked by scholars whose fixation on the ethnic affiliation uh, has occluded the significance of this data to our understanding of ancient society, particularly that pertaining to social bonding and the appreciation of local and regional cultural memory. While I am unable in this short paper to present fully the range of arguments of my thesis, I hope that I will convince you to look again at the traditional picture of greco summation interaction across the steppe and acknowledge that the reality was substantially more complex. Uh, firstly, however, it's pertinent to provide a bit of background to the time period under discussion, because the first century of our era was a time of extreme upheaval in the Pontic steppe. In part, this was a hangover of the first century BC, which left much of the Black Sea region in a weakened position. It is, of course, pertinent to remember that it was in the first half of that century that the Black Sea coast was briefly, almost completely unified under the rule of Mithridates VI Eupator, the king of Pontus in the southeast of the region, whose repeated campaigns against the Romans threatened their hegemony until his final defeat in 63 BC. Colchis was among his first possessions, while he annexed the northern coast of the Black Sea through his general Diophantes in the 110s, following a plea from Chersonesus for aid against the Crimean Scythians. In Olbia, his rule is attested by an inscription dedicating a defensive wall of 77 BC, uh, completed under his strategoi, uh, Diogenes' direction. And he was, of course, killed in Pantacopium, uh, modern day Kerch, on the hill that still bears his name, that bears his name. Following this short alliance, however, the fortunes of the various regions of the Euxine vary dramatically. The southern coast was annexed by Rome, as was Colchis as the province of Lazicum. The Bosphoran kingdom, after periods of internal conflict, uh, eventually emerged as a Roman client state along with Iberia, and Olbia, as with much of the northwest coast of modern-day Romania, Moldova, and western Ukraine, was set upon by the Getae, a precursor to the Dacians and then led by the famous Borobista, who attacked the city in the 50s BC. As a result of this destruction, modern historiography on Olbia has divided the city between its supposed Greek and Roman Vorgetische and Nakgetische periods. This is in spite of the fact that, as to its Roman identity, opinion remains divided as to when, if ever, the city was formally incorporated into the Roman Empire. Moreover, our only eyewitness account of the city at this supposed Roman time, Diochrysostom, speaks of a city obsessed not only with Greek culture, but with a particularly archaizing conception of Greek culture at that. Contrary to the contemporary fashion, the Olbiapolitans were bearded and wore their hair long, and knew a few Greek literary, literary achievements after Homer, who they knew, uh, whom they knew by heart. Only one of the person's dire encounters seems to have an affinity with Rome, and for this he's mocked by his countrymen. But perhaps more than anything else, the conception of a break between the Greek and Roman periods has been compounded by the evidence for waves of barbarian incursions in the region and city at this time. Not simply that of the Getae, but of Sumatian peoples too, of whom Phazois and Ismios emerge as the most celebrated examples. Now, why is this? Well, in part, it's due to an outdated conception of such people groups as marauding nomads whose primary goal was money and who knew only raiding as a way to get it. Not only is this not borne out by the archaeological evidence of a society with a complex social hierarchy and sustained and sophisticated artistic and social developments, it contradicts Dio himself, who states that the barbarian peoples, Scythians according to him, were the driving force between the revitalization of Olbia, as they recognized the potential of the city as a center for trade with the wider classical world. But in more recent years, this impression has rested more on a scholarly fixation with the with the successive waves of migratory people groups west from the Kuban, Lower Volga, and even Kazakh steppes into the Pontic region, each identified with a different name taken from the classical literary sources, whose itinerant lifestyle and short-lived presence in the area has generated a discourse that prioritizes sudden change in the material record over the evidence for long-term continuities. Akradan has already made some extremely good critiques of this approach at the macro scale, 
and I encourage anyone interested in this topic to seek out her article. But here I wish to focus solely on these coin issues as a singular and short-lived instance of this wider trend. Now, on the one hand, I could spend the rest of my time here uh, detailing the various attributions um, that have been made of Fuzzoris and Mios. And really, pretty much each of the people groups that you see on here have at some point been the unquestionable ethnicity of these two people. Uh, successive scholars have asserted the pair are Iorsi, Alan, Serasis from the Kuban region, or even uh, Yazigais on their way to the Great Hungarian Plain. Uh, but we haven't even probably met them yet, so let's do that. Um, on the left, you see a, a, few, a few of the uh, 14 thus far identified coins of Fazoyas, which are made of gold, while the right has a couple of the nine coins attributed to Inesmios, or in one instance spelled Inensimios, made of silver. Now, this doesn't seem like much to go on until you consider that these, along with a simultaneous copper issue of lower denominations that replace the obverse heads with those of Zeus, uh, represent the first coins minted in Orbia after the Getic sack of the mid first century BC, the earliest of these being from the late 50s or early 60s century, um, AD. While these coins are not found in Orbia itself, uh, they actually crop up across the regions west and east of the Dniester. Their provenance of the city is not in doubt, not least because of the city monogram uh, Omicron Lambda that you can see on the reverse of the Farzoyas issues. And you can kind of see it, you can see the O on the second one down on the right of the Farzoyas issue. You can see the O and the end of the Lambda. Um, the other legends you can see give the name of the figures and their title Basileus, which is the Greek for king, and it's a word long associated with rulers of non Greek peoples in the region. Uh, particularly the idiosyncratic jewel titles for the rulers of the Bosphoran kingdom. When these were first examined, Phazoris and Ismios were identified as rulers of Scythian stock, but this has long since been disregarded. On the one hand, the Scythians had, by the last centuries BC, retreated from the Lower Dnieper region into Crimea, and neither name is known from the capital of this late kingdom, Neopolis. On the other, the Tamgas that are found on uh, these coins uh, are rightly being seen now as idiomatically Sumatian, not Scythian uh, iconographs. These tamgas are an extremely interesting aspect of the coins. Not only do they confirm the ethnic affiliation of these individuals, they most likely also indicate their relationship to each other. For as you can see, the tamga of Fazoyas, uh, and you can see that in the top left, is uh, relatively simple. It consists solely of a straight line with a pair of volutes at either end. Um, that of Inismios, on the other hand, it's really just an extension of this image with the addition of a circle in the middle. Now, given their chronological and geographic connections and the parallels drawn from the evolution of Tamga science in the Bosphoran royal family, where we actually do note familial connections between members, there is a strong possibility that Inismios is the successor and son of Phazoyas, uh, giving the Tamgas a dynastic significance. They've also been useful in ascertaining the extent of the region of the ruler's activity. In the 1980s, a burial in the village of Parogi near the Dniester, dating to the last quarter of the first century AD, was found to contain a number of high quality Sumatian artifacts. Some of the Nismios' tamga reproduced exactly, while some have a close variant, and these you can see in the bottom right. This same burial also contained artifacts of apparent Hunnic provenance, known from, con from contemporaneous sites in the Lower Volga and Central Asia that we will return to. In 2019, a similar burial was found in the city of Olbia itself, this time with tamgas resembling those of Farzois and all but confirming the already well-established hypothesis of the minting place of the coins, and that's in the top right. Um, but at the same time, the tamgas have also been a major cause of some of the challenges of their interpretation over the years. Their widespread appearance, even into Bulgaria and Hungary, has led some scholars to posit that the centre of the dominion of these kings was not in Olbia, but further west, undermining the importance of this polis to their rule and, consequently, to the specific iconographic program of their coinage. Moreover, given their eastern provenance, even either in the Kazakh steppe or the Volga region, the appearance of Tamgas in general has been seen to corroborate the theory of migration, with finds such as the Hunnic bow at the Pierogi burial only serving to underline both this origin and its fast-paced nature. All of this has led scholars to focus not on the Olbian context of such issues, but on their wider context within the already exaggerated conception of westward migrations in the region and proffer the aforementioned Sumatian group labels as a result. But all debates regarding the specific Sumatian identity of these coins serve to do is include their Olbian provenance and the complicated ways in which this origin relates to their design and the ruler's self-presentation. 
So firstly, we're going to turn to the weight of the coins. For in their first minting, the coins of the Phasois were minted not to the current Roman standard of an Aureus, but to the starter weight of the Hellenistic era. Now, in subsequent eras, this was there was a transition down to the uh, standard Roman weight, but it's nevertheless significant that the first issues of the king were continuations of that older Attic weight, rather than immediately according to the contemporary standard. This contrasts with the case of uh, Kozon coins, which are likely of Dacian heritage uh, that Greek polys is minted, Greek polys minted um, in the latter decades BC. Uh, and it also brings, of course, to mind those nostalgia-infused citizens that Dio encountered in Olbia. Of even greater importance, however, are the reverse images of the Fazois and Numismios issues, both of which are only understandable within the context of Olbian numismatic history. This is most clearly seen in the reverse of a flying eagle in the Fazois issues. In literature on Olbian numismatics, the image of an eagle in flight, gripping in its talons a fish or dolphin, has been termed the civic emblem, such was its ubiquity in the Olbian mints of earlier centuries BC. In, the context, in this context, it is perhaps notable that the Tamgar of Phosoius, you know, that is the most assuredly summation element of its design, is not treated in a detached way with regard to the ancient emblem, but is compositionally integral to it, replacing the earlier fish dolphin uh, in the talons of the eagle. It is further notable that one of the countermarks found on Fasoya's issues, used to continue or broaden its distribution, was precisely such a dolphin as the Tamga replaced. Pointedly placed, however, in such a way as to not overlap the rest of the emblem. You can see that here. Uh, in, the, in his Mios issues, similarly, the appearance of Tai Chi uh, recalls Hellenistic precursors and the importance of the city as an entity. While these long-standing images, alongside equally traditional images for the Albion mint like Demeter and Apollo, are also found in the more quotidian copper issues of the city that were simultaneous to the gold and silver coins, but lack the ruler image. Now, what does this mean? Well, I argue that it signifies one of two possibilities. The first could be that the Hunnic artifacts at, at Pierogi and the Tamgas do indicate that Phasois and Inismios were truly by birth of a culture far to the east of Olbia, who, upon encountering a citizenry as obsessed with the past as Dyer presents them as being, the incoming summations essentially allowed the Olbiopolitan to measure a freedom to design coins, stipulating only their portraits and maybe the gold and silver material of their issues. But there is an alternative view. Recall how the Tamga is embedded into the traditional emblem of the city. Think on the simultaneity of a royal and a common mint bearing similar imagery. Could it not be the case that we are witnessing a more complicated evolution of communal iconography? Summations, as we know from the Protogenes decree, had been in the vicinity of Olbia for several centuries to this point. The aforementioned campaign of Mithridates' general Diophantes, moreover, was stipulated in part by the attacks of a people likely to have been the Roxolani. Indeed, the very transition from the Fazoyas Tamga to that of Inismia seems to indicate an interest in the curation of dynastic symbolism, such that might echo the use of traditional civic imagery. Perhaps these coins demonstrate a more nuanced conception of the Greek Sumatian cultural divide one based on a shared appreciation of long-standing iconographic and historical knowledge and technique, perhaps drawn, to some extent, from the shared experience of these communities present in this area over a longer period of time than traditionally considered. Certainly, it seems that this is too complicated a process to be considered solely in terms of the rampaging nomads. Instead, we appear to be looking at a curated self-representation of power attuned to both localized artistic traditions and more modern dynastic legacies. In concluding, I'd like to say that several of these themes are observable not only in other Albion material, but also in the Bosphoran Kingdom centered on the Taman and Kerch peninsulas. These developed and complicated processes across the northern coast of the Black Sea, deeply tied both to developments of the Kuban, southern Russia and general northern Caucasus region, are not well served by a discussion centered solely on the successive waves of differentiated people groups moving west. Rather, we must conceptualize change both locally and regionally with a more long-term perspective, attuned to the vagaries of the evidence, but not driven by it to the extent that we miss the continuities at play. In the Black Sea region in antiquity, cultural bonds did not end with the death of Mithridates. And I hope that in the course of this paper, I have shown some of the ways in which Olbia Pontica retained its pertinence for the study of the classical Caucasus. Thank you very much. As I was the uh, speaker, maybe I can ask uh, Gwen or Narmin to uh, sort of, if we have questions, seek them out for me as I pour myself a glass of water.
audience have a question to Rachel? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. That was a really, I mean, I'm completely on board with this idea of um, the articulation of models of power that are intelligible in both, a, like in a variety of local and international, broadly interconnected contexts. One of the feelings that I get working in the South Caucasus about the people who are called the Sarmatians is that they just actually don't exist, right? That like there are clearly these like super complex step connected populations up there. There's, I mean, there's a there's a real thing, but but the idea of quote unquote the Sarmatians. And I wonder if that's something that you feel working in the space that you're working in, or whether you feel that there is more integrity to this group in the space, that there is actually something. And I I mean, I know that the textual evidence in, in the North Pontic is quite different from the textual references that we have to the step populations in the in the North Caucasus. Um, so I just, I wonder where your head is about that and what you're feeling about that. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, I think that is a valid way of just approaching this because I think that really, if anything, I kind of look at it from the other way in the sense that what, as you say, what I'm dealing with here is just a lot of literary sources which are locating various people groups, um, some with the same name exactly, some with variations of the name such that, um, you know, you would basically assume that they're talking about the same person, but different transliterations, um, situated in just this area broadly. So if anything, I kind of lean more to using the summations as a sort of umbrella term for these groups, simply because the complexity, and also I would argue the confusion of these sources is, is such that um, it's, it's just a simply a, a better term to use. Because as I, you know, as I say in the talk, if you try to locate where a specific group is, the Orsi or the Roxolani or what have you, and you follow the literary sources, you're going to go mad, you know, and particularly, you know, when it turns to trying to, to uh, map that onto archaeological material as well. No, I mean, and this is, I mean, sir, I, I, I mean, I, I move in the more deconstructionist direction mm. in the North Caucasus of really not, ta of not using, of saying, we have these names, they actually mean nothing in this context. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're actually, like, they're actually meaningless. And what we have are a variety of populations that have an incredibly broad range of life ways that range from very, very, very pastoralist to really not. And that are probably, I mean, they're probably 600 names that we don't have. And they probably change every 20 years. Um, and so I, uh, and, and so like, so I guess I was, and, and I think your answer answers this quite well, which is that your response to this problem is different than the yeah. response that I take, but you see the same problem with yeah. your material. I'm always uh, curious with people who work with the North Pontic material, whether, whether any of this works any better in the North Pontic than it does in the North Caucasus, but it sounds like no, the answer is no. Well, thank you so much. I completely agree with you. I, I, I think most of these names are, you know, number one, it's it's a tiny fraction of what these actual and but also the the speed with which these names would have been dropped or taken the fact that these are all classical sources as well it just leads to the point that what is actually the use of these sources as I say for me my way of approaching this is to, to is to adopt a more broader umbrella term mm -hmm. the summations mm -hmm. being the one that lends itself but yeah mm -hmm. I completely agree with you that yeah if if we spend our days trying to identify to, specifically. Yeah. Um, you know, Roxolani or I yeah. see or Alan. In, I mean, as I say, I mean, for those in it, scholars have sort of really sort of said, no, no, it is unquestionable that they are this. And then 10 minutes, you know, 10 years down the line, unquestionably this. What is, awesome. what is to be gained from saying this? Yeah, Very yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, very interesting question. No, I mean, I'm not seeing anything else in the uh, in the chat or with raised hands. So maybe I can uh, introduce Ian or? Yes, that would be great, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, our final presentation for today uh, is Dr. Ian Colvin. Uh, Ian is a historian and Byzantinist, at, uh, researcher at the University of Cambridge, working with the Cambridge School Classics Project. He is co-director of the Anglo-Georgian expedition to 
Nicola Covey uh, since 2001 and a trustee of the British charity Friends of Academic Research in Georgia and author or, and co-author of various publications on the history and archaeology of Lazica and the South Caucasus, on the history and historiography of late antiquity and on the teaching of classics. Ian, I look forward to, to your talk. Take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks um, to all the organisers and indeed to the audience who come to listen. And uh, and to my fellow speakers who've given a, a fascinating set of talks. And I think um, in some ways, um, hopefully my talk will follow on nicely from them. Um, I'm gonna move to this slide, first of all, um, which I throw in simply to emphasize um, what perhaps our previous speakers already um, uh, done, that the Caucasus and Lazica, which I'm gonna talk about, is at the intersection where three worlds um, uh, butt up against each other. So the Mediterranean world of Greco-Roman civilization, represented in, in my period. The, the, now, it's worth my pausing to say, when I say late antiquity, I'm using it really from the 4th century AD through till um, the 7th or even the 8th century AD, what might be termed early feudal um, in the Caucasus sometimes, but I would prefer to use that for my late antiquity. Um, so you've got the East Roman Empire, uh, of, of the Mediterranean world butting up against the Sasanian world. Um, we can see that stretching all the way across into Central Asia. And then the third um, world, which we've just been listening about, of course, is that great nomad world of the steppes, all the way from um, the, um, all the way from the Mongol, um, work, Mongol uh, and Chinese borders across to uh, Hungary and uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and touching the Romans and Sasanians worlds, both in the Caucasus, of course, I wonder if I can make my pointer work, no, not like that, like that, yeah, both in the Caucasus and, of course, for the Romans on the uh, Danube frontier, for the um, Sasanians and their Central Asian frontiers. Um, now, it would be tempting, of course, to throw in two other worlds uh, who influenced the Caucasus here. Um, one of which uh, lies to the south between the Roman and Iranian worlds, that is the, um, the Semitic world that, that divides, um, sits between them um, and has such an influence on Caucasian culture. And the other, of course, um, is the um, indigenous cultures of the Caucasus, um, uh, whose shared elements of culture are so beautifully em emphasised by those opening lines of the uh, medieval Kartlis Skovreba, um, uh, which underlines how the peoples are all descended from Targamos. Um, so first let us recall that for the Armenians and Georgians and Ranians and Movkanians and Hares and Lex, Mingralians and Caucasians, there was a single father named Targamos. And it goes on to explain how he settled between Ararat and Marsis in Armenia, and the lands that were assigned to his innumerable family lay between the two seas and the Caucasus Mountains. Now, uh, most of my slides are going to look at this area here, uh, squared in red, um, the Caucasus of the South, the Caucasus, the South Caucasus, and specifically the Western South Caucasus, Colchis or Lazica, modern day West Georgia. And uh, I'll give you a very brief summary of Lars history up to the sixth century, which in, in some way joins onto the um, history that Lara gave us at the start. So the Lars are one among several peoples settled in Colchis from at least the first century AD, and most probably earlier. In the second century, uh, the Lars kings are one of four friendly kings that Arian mentions in his tour of inspection of the Roman garrisons on this coast. Uh, another four peoples are not described as friendly. You see the friendly ones along the uh, eastern and northern side. Um, the Drilloi or Sanoi or Tsans, if we like, are considered hostile. And um, the Macalonis, Henioki, and Zidritai, uh, Arian doesn't specify. Um, the Lars adopted Christianity, like their Armenian, Iberian, Roman neighbors, in the first half of the fourth century. Some scholars have a different view on that, but that's what I'm going to stick with and we can discuss it in the questions if we want. By the mid-fifth century, um, the Roman garrisons on this coast seem to have been reduced to two on the Abasgian coast and the Apsilian coasts, 
uh, Pitchus and Sevastopolis here. Um, the last kings by this stage are preeminent among their neighbouring peoples. Uh, um, the name Lars is often used uh, interchangeably with Colchis in our sources. Um, uh, and maybe since the 4th century, late 4th century or early 5th, the Romans seem to have delegated some of the oversight of the regions to them. Uh, this may have uh, happened in the wake of the Roman Sasanian division of the South Caucasus at the end of the 4th century. But in any case, there are signs of, in our sources of changes in the Roman management of the appointment of Svan kings around this time. I'll come back to that. Despite some signs of stress in the Roman Lars relationship in the mid fifth century, in the 450s and 60s, including a multi year war in the 450s, um, the Lars appear to have remained Roman allies until near the end of the fifth or the very early sixth century. And at that point, they slipped quietly out of Roman control. No source records this and apparently submitted to the Sasanians, their kings apostatizing and no doubt adopting Zoroastrianism to please their new suzerains. All this is unmentioned by our sources and needs to be inferred. For in 522 or early 523, uh, the chronographer Mal Malalas and others report that the new Lars king Tzath departed from Sasanian territory on the death of his father, uh, who was a Persian subject, he was received at the Emperor Justin's court, baptised, married to a uh, patrician wife, and sent back to his country laden with gifts. This reception of a Persian ally provokes a brief outbreak of war, followed by more diplomacy, which in turn is key to the outbreak of war with the Sasanians a few years later. In effect, Lars Kokolchis in the 6th century becomes an important theatre of Roman Sasanian warfare, between 528 to 532, again in 541 to 556, uh, and indeed the sole theatre of conflict between 548 and 556, and uh, is yet again the subject of diplomatic dispute in the 560s, and uh, it remains disputed into the remaining wars of the second half of the 6th century, um, in Roman armies and Sasanian armies fighting through Svania, Lazica, Iberia and the South Caucasus as a whole. So in the 6th century, for about 50 years, the South Caucasus became a major cause of warfare between the two great powers of late antiquity, the Romans and Sasanians. Now, why was it important? Uh, now, militarily, control of Colchis was important for three things which I've put up here on this slide, and geography is key in each case. Firstly, for access to passes into Iberia. Uh, the main route is over the Surami Ridge, and it might be worth my just, um, many of you will know exactly where the Surami Ridge and the Licky Mountains are, but here we go. Um, secondly, for access to passes to the North Caucasus and the steppe world beyond, um, and there are a number of passes along the main ridge here above Abazgia, Apsilia, Svania and Nisimia, and again across to um, uh, the best pass of all, the Darial Gates, uh, north of Metzcheta and Tbilisi. Um, thirdly, um, of course, uh, Lazica is important for coastal communications to the southwest towards the Roman Empire and to the northwest along the Circassian coast towards the Bosporan and Chersonese, and on no doubt to Olbia. Now, the order of these three things is uh, Procopius of Caesarea's. Um, he uh, mentions them uh, in a, an invented speech where he uh, explains why Khuzro uh, uh, should want to uh, hold on to uh, Lazica in the 540s. Um, but um, it's worth my saying a couple more things about them. The passes into Iberia, for example. Procopius uh, emphasizes that while the Romans held Lazica, the Persians could feel no security in their hold on Iberia, because Lazica provided a place of safety for the, for the Iberians to revolt, uh, and events back him up on this. The return of the Lars to a Roman alliance in 522 or 523 was followed within 18 months by an Iberian revolt against their Sasanian overlords, 
And when this was suppressed by the Sasanians, because promised Ro uh, Roman military support failed to arrive in time, the Iberians' rebel king, Gurgenes, uh, his family and his nobles took refuge in the rough territory, um, the rough territory on the Las border, uh, the, around here, presumably the Licky Mountains. Um, much indeed as their forebears had under Vakhtan Gorgasali's uh, revolt uh, a generation earlier in 484. Um, no wonder the Sasanians were happy to seize and retain Lazica, or at the very least its uh, eastern part, whenever they had a chance. Um, uh, Mochiresis, which appears in uh, Procopius's uh, and Agathius's accounts of these wars, it's clear that the um, Sasanians often hold this eastern part of, um, of Lazica, which I think is what is meant by the region of Mochiresis, although uh, Procopius occasionally also calls it a city. Um, now, even after the endless peace of 532, by which the Romans recognized Sasanian control of Iberia, there's a hint in our sources that Justinian considered inciting Iberian unrest. Theophanes, you know, the chronicler, um, 8th century, states that in uh, Anno Mundi 6027, um, that is AD 534 or 5, an Iberian king, Samanazos, uh, travelled to Constantinople with his wife and senators, was received warmly and honoured with many presents and sent back to his kingdom in peace. Samanazos may or may not be Pharasmanos, uh, the fifth, uh, but uh, there are various su suggestions, but I think it's it's wrong uh, of many uh, late, late antique historians to ignore this little piece of information. Uh, it's, um, uh, well, we can talk about it more in, 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 the, in, in the questions if, if one wanted, but uh, it seems to me that, that Justinian is playing at this point with causing difficulties for the Sasanians. Um, after all, Samanazas is also mentioned by Malalas uh, uh, in 528 as the Iberian king um, who succeeded presumably Gorgonis. Um, now, after the Lars came over to the Sasanians in 541, uh, therefore, the Persians could certainly feel more secure in their control of Iberia at least until um, the return of Lazica to Roman control in the Treaty of 562. Back to uh, my second point, the control of the passes to the North Caucasus. What was happening here? Procopius declares that Lazica was a bulwark against the barbarians living in the Caucasus and says elsewhere that the allied Lars owed the Romans no tribute, their only obligation being to ensure that the Huns to their north might not invade the Roman Empire. And he says that the Persians desired Lazica so that they might send the Huns against the Romans whenever they pleased. There is some support for this view that Lazica sat astride Hun invasion routes in Peter the Patrician's account of negotiations for control of the region around 562. Um, Khusro, um, Peter reports, mentions in these um, negotiations for peace that he'd only ever heard of Swania back in 550 uh, or 551 when his general in Lazica accepted the Swan's submission and explained to him that it was located on the Scythian invasion routes. Um, we have later evidence uh, under Theophanes again, uh, uh, who writes about um, the uh, later emperor uh, Leo III um, sorry, Leo, uh, yeah, yes, uh, writes about his campaign up in the Caucasus at the end of the um, seventh or early part of the eighth century, that Roman and Alan forces cross the passes above Absilia and Abasgia in the early part of um, that century. Um, but uh, I think what I want to suggest is that uh, other evidence shows a different level of interaction across these pass passes, and I'm going to return to this. Um, but in effect, um, the passes here in the West Caucasus are higher and harder than the better routes further east in the Sasanian sphere. And I'm just going to pull this slide up as perhaps showing the um, wider world a bit, a bit better. 
Um, so the Darial is is very much the uh, the key pass in the Central Caucasus. The passes further west are closed to um, travel for much longer periods of the year, um, uh, subject to higher snowfalls, and they are much less suitable for the movement of large bodies of men and horses. It seems far more probable that the Persians in control of Larzaca, should they seek to direct Huns against the Romans, would send them via the Caspian gates and over the Surami Ridge, and then towards the Roman Empire, or indeed towards the Roman Empire through a healthy uh, direction uh, and Armenia. Um, so I think there's a question mark over exactly how that, how Larzaca functions as a, a bulwark against the, against the Huns. My third uh, point was the coastal communications. Um, and the Romans had felt the effects of failure to control movement along the coasts uh, in the mid third century, when uh, in the 250s, Scythians and Borani, um, that is northerners um, uh, from the northern coast of the Euxine, had taken to the Black Sea and raided far and wide in Europe and Asia. They'd captured and burnt Pharsis and Trebizond at this time, uh, the latter being a serious fortification defended by 11,000 men and in normal times. Um, uh, it demonstrates the scale of the problems that loss of control of the Black Sea could cause. So into the sixth century, it makes sense that the Romans may still have been concerned that conceding the Persians control of Larzaca entailed the risk of a uh, Sasanian attack along their Pontic coast as far as Constantinople, as Procopius relates. Let's return to the evidence for smaller scale crossings of these West Caucasian passes. And I want to look at, at, at how this, uh, these links with the, um, how these links with the uh, North Caucasus worked. Um, just seeing whether I've got a, a good slide, that'll do. So um, we've got a number of pieces of uh, evidence for smaller scale crossings of these West Caucasian passes. In 548, for example, Justinian sent uh, his general uh, for Armenia, Dagestheus, to um, support the Lars king Gubaz to expel the Persians from Larzaca at Gubaz's request. And at this point, Gubaz wrote to Justinian and asked him to send money, three kentenaria that Gubaz had promised to the Sabias and the Alans in return for their support. Uh, I don't know if you can, how much you can see, um, thanks to, um, the, the Alans are up here north of the um, north of the central and western Caucasus, the Sabias probably above the eastern Caucasus in this period. And uh, Gubaz says that uh, if this money is provided, um, it will help defend Larzaca and it will devastate Iberia so that it would be so destitute of men that not even the Persians would be able to come in from there in the future. And furthermore, uh, another piece of evidence, in 550, a party of Sabirs who are present at the siege of Petra, Petra is uh, here, Sikizdiri, modern Sikizdiri, um, uh, and these Sabirs from the North Caucasus uh, were there because the man that Justinian, the emperor, had selected to carry a subsidy to them had been unwilling to proceed through the troubled Caucasus, uh, presumably along one of these routes, um, with the money. Uh, remember, at this time, war was raging in Larzaca between the Romans and the Persians. Um, instead, he sent uh, a messenger to the Sabirs, who sent men to him at Petra to collect it. Uh, they were consequently there when Bessas was besieging the city towards the end of 550 or early 551. And a few years after that, uh, in 555 or 556, uh, a Roman general, um, Sotericus, was travelling again in these high mountain valleys in Messimia. Um, when uh, the Messimians encountering him um, uh, became anxious that he intended to betray their fortress to the Alans. Um, this, they thought, might be so that, he, so that it would be easier for the Romans to provide subsidies to the neighbouring mountain tribes. Um, this is Agathius' uh, report. Um, and so Tericus, travelling to distribute subsidies indeed, um, uh, uh, was ambushed, killed, and all the emperor's gold was seized. 
And the Messimians then, of course, um, recognizing that they were going to be in trouble, sent uh, to the Persians for protection. Um, finally, um, the following year, when the Roman uh, expected Roman expeditionary force uh, against the Messimians uh, begins to march through Apsilia and gets to Sebelda prior to advance against Messimia, it pauses there for a period because uh, there are Persians in Messimia and they feel unable to get in. Uh, during that period, um, the um, Agathius tells us of the arrival of a group of 500 Sabiers into Messimia, um, presumably traveling by a route uh, over, the, um, over the mountains, though conceivably Svanetti being, um, being controlled by the Persians at the time, they could have traveled uh, a, 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 along a, a southern route uh, south of the main ridge. Um, but uh, it is likely um, that they um, that they may have uh, come over. Finally, my last piece of evidence for these smaller scale uh, the contacts across the Caucasus. And in 570, the Emperor Justin uh, sent an embassy to the Western Turks at the suggestion of the Sogdian Manuk. Um, Zemarchus, the am ambassador, traveled along these routes north of Abasgia uh, uh, and Mesimia. Um, crossing the mountains through through the mountains here um, and um, concluded an alliance but on his return the Persians who knew he was doing this um, were lying in wait to ambush him in Messimia uh, and he had to he had to as a result um, he was warned by the Alans and he had to change his return route so I think what I'm getting at is that we have possibly um, less a major invasion route the considerable evidence for the importance of these uh, lesser routes uh, for small scale diplomatic traffic and subsidies, um, even, of course, under Zemarchus and, and uh, Maniac's um, uh, embassies, the, the possibility of considering them for trade. Um, as well as perhaps, of course, the movement of smaller groups of warriors. Um, and it seems that this diplomacy that the Romans conducted across these routes was was absolutely key for their communications with the Alans the Huns of the North Caucasus and the other nomad tribes, and indeed even as far afield as Central Asia, um, the Turks and perhaps also the Hephthalites, who are uh, the Romans are sometimes in contact with. Now, I'm aware I'm in danger of overrunning my allotted time. So to try and bring all these loose ends together, um, why uh, did Larzica suddenly begin to rise in importance for the Romans during the fifth and indeed the second half of the fifth century. Um, Priscus's first notices about the Lars appear at a particular point in steppe history. Um, Attila's, his Attila's empire, uh, this, is, this is mid fifth century, Attila's empire, which for nearly three decades had been the scourge of the Romans, uh, scourge of the Romans, collapsed in the wake of his death in 454. And at the Battle of the Nadal, around 455, of course, the subject peoples famously overthrew the Huns' overlordship, creating another great wave of instability uh, beyond the Danube that threatened Roman control of the Balkans. It's interesting that it is just at this point uh, that the Emperor Marcion saw fit to try and rein in his client king, Gubaz I of Larzica. Um, uh, Gubaz had appointed his son co-ruler without the emperor's permission. Um, or was it in fact that Gubaz saw fit to test his um, suzerain's resolve and to try what independence he could manage? Um, whichever way it is, Gubaz managed to defeat Marcion's expeditionary force. Um, and there's an interesting entry in the Suda that's not well known. Um, uh, it's not, for example, in Karl um Georgica volumes. Um, but perhaps should be if we ever do an electronic update of them, um, which um, uh, confirms what the better known parts of Priscus tell us, that the um, Laz successfully destroyed a Roman army, uh, forcing the Romans to make plans uh, to pursue the war in a second season uh, via a land invasion. Um, the Lars, meanwhile, sent uh, um, uh, ambassadors both to the Persians and the Romans. Uh, they requested Persian intervention, which was refused. And, um, but on the Roman side, um, Gubaz was told that he and his son could not both remain king. Um, 
and he agreed to step down in favour of his son and was ordered to travel to Constantinople. Now, reading between these lines, the wily old king seems to have successfully obtained his ends. Relations were patched up and he did eventually visit Constantinople, being shown one of the wonders of the age, this stylite Saint Daniel on his pillar. But this was six or seven years later. Gubaz is clearly still king and there is no sign of his having stepped down. And yet the Romans, though initially anxious that he might be treating with the Persians, nevertheless patch up this alliance with him. So that when two years later in 467, Gubaz requests a Roman army to support him against a threatened Persian and Iberian invasion, the Emperor Leo sends his general Heraclius to Larzica to hold the Persians and the Iberians off. Um, and he does it again the following year because Heraclius gets sent home um, when the Alas discover its expensive business supporting, um, supporting a Roman army and the, um, uh, uh, the invasion has been delayed. How did Gubaz manage to do this to defy the Romans and maintain good relations with them? I think some of the answer lies in the steps. Um, the early 460s saw uh, the arrival of new forces in the Ponto-Caspian steppe. Um, Um, and Gubaz's uh, arrival in Constantinople followed not long after the arrival of ambassadors from new tribes, the Turkic Saragors, Ogors and Onogors um, uh, reached Constantinople. Um, these latter claimed to have been driven from their homes by the Sabir Huns, uh, themselves of course driven on by the Avars who would follow them onto the steppes in the following century, onto the Ponto Caspian steppes. Um, uh, and they sought a Roman alliance now, um, did these ambassadors arrive via Larzica, like the later Turkish ambassadors of the 6th century? Um, in any case, they may well have changed the Romans' calculations of war and peace. Uh, an alliance was granted them, and it's notable that in 467, these peoples attacked the Persians and Iberians via the Daryal Gorge. Um, Persian ambassadors who arrived in Constantinople around this same time, demanding the customary Roman payments to help meet the mutual expense of barring these Caspian gates to the barbarians were rebuffed. Leo may at around this time have invented a claim that the Mesopotamian fortress of Nisibis that had been handed to the Persians in 363 in the wake of Julian's disastrous campaign had only been ceded for a hundred years and was therefore due for return. In any case one suspects that the Iberian and Persian threat to Lazica that Gubaz needed help with in 467 and 468 was not unrelated to the Romans' refusal of payments and to their new alliance with the Saragors. And the importance of Swania, which was somehow involved, uh, but uh, our, our source is lacunose uh, and fails to explain exactly how, uh, has to be surely to do with its control over the passes of the, of the, of the Western Caucasus. Now, conclude, um, I just wanted to bring this to, together, uh, in effect, uh, by saying that um, Roman and Sasanian relations and relations with the steppe world um, uh, are absolutely crucial, of course. Um, and the South Caucasus as a whole is trapped in this relationship with these surrounding powers, these three surrounding powers, really, if you count the whoever's in charge of the steppe at any one time as one of the as a third power. I, I, I felt Lana's paper emphasizing diplomatic role of the Caucasus um, uh, sort of ties in with this. How does these, these 300 centenaria that get sent north are probably not coin, they all, at least they may well be diplomatic gifts of one sort or another. Um, and uh, I felt that um, the links with the steppe world through Olbia, uh, the Bosporan, um, Kersenese and Crimea um, all um, link up with this Roman feeling that Lazica uh, can be compared with uh, uh, these other um, Black Sea kingdoms, client kingdoms, and uh, they are windows for the Romans into that um, steppe world. I'm going to round up there, um, but uh, I, I think the, uh, that and the, the defence of the Caspian Gates is crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. That was really interesting, fascinating. Uh sort of journey through the literary sources very much and uh, 
really, yeah, and, and well brought it all together. Hi, hey, um, my, it's a kind of question, or I think my video stopped working. Mostly. That's okay, I can hear you. So uh, my question is um, a little bit like er earlier times than uh, the fifth century, but maybe also fifth. So um, uh, the silver vessels, like well, I, as I mentioned, that it's uh, it's important to study these relations with the, these uh, powers, like Sasanians and Romans, and uh, about like the controlling the North Caucasian paths and etc. So uh, a few years ago, I studied this group of the silver uh, cups, which were discovered in the territory of Abkhazia, like territory of Absils and Abbas. And uh, two of these silver cups, uh, they, um, these cups mention the name of the king Pakor, Pakorus. And this inscription says, uh, I think you, you've heard about this, um, about these vessels. And this uh, uh, inscription say that this is from King Pakor, and another cup's inscription say that this is from King Pakorus to his sheep, which could be identified as his wasals or the people he subjected or etc. And um, I was trying to study whether this King Pak, who is this King Pakorus? It is King of Lazica from, uh, I think from the second century uh, or something. Uh, King of Iberia become Pakorus. It's like Pakur Mepe, which is uh, also Iberian king's name. And there is King Pakur in Armenia. So I was try trying to study this really complex uh, situation, like who was Pakorus, the king, and who sent this, uh, vessels and to whom, and uh, I think um, I, I was I, I I didn't really decide which king it was, but uh, this uh, Winogrado, this Russian scholar who who works in the North Caucasus, he uh, he suggested that this King Pakorus must have been Iberian King Pakor the Fourth, who ruled the country in the fifth century, that Iberia time to time gained some control over these people living in uh, in Abkhazia, like Absils and Abbas. And they were not always controlled by Lazica, but also by Iberian kings. And uh, it could mean that uh, through Iberia, it was Sasanian control over this like Northwest Caucasian mountain paths and etc. So it's really, really like complex picture. And um, I would love to have some like help with identifying this King Pakuris and also like, because I, I'm not studying the Lazica in West Georgia in, in so well and these silver vessels could be like also interesting for you. And uh, some additional information about uh, Sasanian Roman uh, battles and Lazica's and Iberia's involvement. And these things will be also really um, helpful for me to kind of complete this research I was doing a few years ago. So that's not a question, more like a comment, but that's what I wanted no, it's to. No, it's a very helpful and, and very interesting. Um, I, I think um, one of the problems, obviously, is that um, these royal names um, are often more widespread than we perhaps know, and, and we are really hobbled by the shortage of um, sources that we have, particularly in, in the West, um, Western Georgia. Eastern Georgia is, for most periods, much better resourced in terms of sources, uh, literary sources rather than um, um, uh, material um, archaeological sources. Um, now, um, the one exception is this great war of Lazica, Lazica's Didiomi, um, when we suddenly, for a period of five decades, 50 years or so, we have lots and lots and lots of um, good uh, eventual information about um, Lazica and you're know, a little bit before that with Priscus etc um, which I was touching on there uh, but it is uh, it is problematic um, because th then you have the local apart from the Armenian sources which barely touch on these you know the odd mention by um, Razar Parpetsi um, we're thrown back on these much later Georgian sources which have a very a legendary character for this period and may have germs of truth but it's very hard to separate them so indeed not in Bakor's reign but in Vakhtang Gorgasali's reign there's this claimed campaign that 
it's supposedly Gord Gasali went over against the Alan, over the mountains through the Darial against the Alans, campaigned through Alania, and then crosses over into Ab Abkhazia, Abazgia, and um, and captures much of that. While, according to the um, source, the Romans are busy fighting elsewhere. Um, it's a wonderfully interesting story and very hard to weigh up. In in my opinion, I'm doubtful because it seems to me that the Romans keep a fairly close control when they can of um, of Abasgir and Apsilia precisely because they are these this this window onto the steppe um, for them. Um, certainly until the uh, Bosporan, um, Kersonesian kingdoms are, are recovered in, in under Justinian. There's a long period when the Romans don't have any of the north coast as a way of, of looking into the steppe world. Um, but you're right, it's fascinating. It's, re it's really interesting and it does require more research. I should, I should, I should look it up. There's a recent paper by, um, uh, who is it? Schleicher, I think, uh, in, in the 2018 volume, which talks about just how difficult um, uh, it, it, the, the name of the, the book is Iberia, it, it's German, Iberia between, um, uh, I'll put it in the, I'll put it in the, in the chat in a minute and dig out the proper, proper name, but he says just how difficult that section of the Cartes Scovre Bar is to use historically, and I think he's right, he's got some interesting ideas. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Very interesting presentation, thanks. <laughs> well, as was yours, Lana, and I think at this point we'll try to uh, open the floor for questions for sort of any of any and all of the uh, four speakers, myself included, and Jehan, of course. Um, to kind of frame that, I, I think some of the reflections I've kind of made on this is that, yeah, there's a lot of still kind of... Um, disciplinary, um, superficial divisions, you know, even in the definition of late antiquity, you know, Lana, you were saying sort of from the first century AD, which to a sort of um, scholar based in more Mediterranean, that that's it's a very different sort of definition to particularly what Ian was talking about there. Um, and obviously we, we have, you know, the, the historical sort of uh, disciplinary divide, the Soviet school methodologies, classics, uh, sort of West and East classics uh, and what have you. Um, but each of our presentations has sort of demonstrated just how sort of embedded in all of these wider networks um, each of our sites has been and each of this region generally is, you know. Ian there talking about just how important this was for both the Sasanians and the Romans and indeed the steppe peoples. Lana demonstrating a sort of, um, as it were, sort of the agency of, of the people in Georgia themselves with how they were managing tribute, perhaps with all of these silver uh, vessels. And Jehan talking, you know, about the imports and the idea of multi-cultural, uh, multi-ethnic communities through the cemeteries in Kabbalah. Um, with, you know, ditto uh, Fazois and Ismios and, and the relationship there between Sumatians and, and Greeks, as it were. So perhaps that's a couple of themes to sort of uh, pick up on now as we turn for, for 10 minutes or so to a, to a more general Q&A discussion. Yeah, may, may I say uh, about this term late antiquity, it's uh, one of the like most uh, confusing thing when I speak uh, in like international conferences, when I speak about late antiquity, I always say it according to the Georgian chronological like frames because uh, yeah, it's uh, me medieval times in Georgia starts uh, in the mid fourth century when Christianity was declared as a state religious of the country. But uh, we uh, still see that um, not everything changes uh, with the changing the state religion of the country and uh, some point my guess would be that we we shouldn't call early medieval times from the fourth century but much later on because um, like in the in the sixth century sixth seventh century we still have this really um, strong Zoroastrian influence in Georgia and lots of archaeological materials correspond to this um, really strong influences from Persia as well as from the Byzantine Empire. Like it's a big mixture. And 
uh, yeah, in Georgia, it's like first four centuries. It's called late antiquity. It's called Roman times. And um, yeah, it doesn't correspond to the late antiquity, which is adopted in, um, in like in Europe and in. Yeah, I, I mean, these sort of labels that we give periods, they, they kind of enlighten as much as they occlude. As I was saying, you know, in the case of Albia, we have, you know, this defined Greek and Roman period, but actually not only is there evidence of it perhaps not being as Roman as we would sort of assume from that term, but also those continuities, which I was talking about. And as you say, you know, you have the same thing when you label something as uh, medieval, you know, as opposed to late antiquity, you assume there's a, a large scale change. Yeah. These, these, the, you know, no one, no one wakes up on a day and goes, right, well, I've gone from late antiquity to medieval. This is a much longer term process, which has, you know, longstanding influences. Lara, join the fray. All right. So I have a, a comment about that, a comment about map, mountain passes, and then a question that is mostly actually coming off of Lana's presentation, but is sort of generally applicable. The comment about the chronology thing is um, on the flip side of this, the fact that the Antigone period begins in the Achaemenid period is actually really interesting and important, I think, um, in terms of thinking about how material culture in the region has been understood, that there's this continuity that is absolutely lacking in Western European and Anglo-American perceptions of what was happening in the Achaemenid Near East that was deeply embedded in regional scholarly understandings of the evolution of material culture, which is to say, that there is a very strong Achaemenid substratum through this space. And it's one that is strong enough that it just that it determines the beginning of a new period. So first comment there. Second comment, I love this idea of um, the mountain passes as windows into the steppe. Um, there's a, um, and this is obviously much later information, but there's a great passage about um, in from the Karthistov about David the Builder where he's talking about what he needs to do to control, the like, sort of keep military control. And, the, and I, don't, I don't have it in front of me, but the, the quote is something like, he needs to get, he needs to capture the fortress at Dariali, but he also needs to secure all of the rest of the passes into Ossetia and across the Caucasus. So it's understood in this incredible, strongly networked perception um, of what it means to control movement through this space. And I think, the other thing, Ian, that I thought was really great that you did is to talk about this idea that maybe it is a high-level diplomatic activity that's actually moving through this space, which I think is does not get enough credit um, because people who aren't familiar with how these spaces work assume that nobody wants to be moving through their, their spaces, which is completely wrong. The thing is that the people who have the most and best access to how you move through those spaces are exactly the ones who are going to be doing it. Um, so I think those are super, like, two really interesting points um, about that, that I was thinking about while I was listening to your talk and I really appreciated actually having some of the late antique sources that you were citing for this argument because those are things that I haven't um, spent as much time on and they're super helpful for me also. Um, my question that comes off of Lana's presentation but that is also like open to the group is what on earth is going on in the second and first century BC in this space? Why do we have this tremendous and, and is it, like, do we actually have that tremendous break? How much of this is mirages that are about how we are dating material? How secure do we feel about the dates for this material? Um, why is the Hellenistic, the late Hellenistic, let's see if we wanna use sort of the international Anglophone chronology, why is that period so difficult to put your fingers on? And why is there such a gigantic break in the first century CE? Um, I'm very curious if anybody has any thoughts about these things. Okay, well, I'll, I'll let you answer first, Lana, as that was somewhat directed to you. Oh, that's a um, good point, Lara. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> um, it's yeah. so nice to see you. It's been a really long time. It's really yeah, awesome it's, to have this digital opportunity. Time. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, second first century BC was uh, my nightmare to study because uh, it, it's really, really tough. And even uh, like I tried to analyze what was going on in, in Georgia, like to analyze general picture. Sadly, I do not have any silver from that time, so I can discuss according to the silverware. But uh, it seems like Georgia is really like a buffer zone between this um, uh, like Kingdom of Pontus, like Mithridatic Wars, let's say, 
and um, it's it's a big chaos in the country, I would say. So they they were more focused on a short. I don't know how to say that um, in English. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we we see that uh, there is no stability, political stability, economic stability. There is uh, they that Georgia had really uh, like intense relations with outer world and uh, like trade economic relations with the rest of the Hellenized world was really really intense. But um, like archaeologically, it's still. Uh, especially in the West Georgia, because in East Georgia, there is some signs of the formation of the Kingdom of Iberia and the rise at uh, Farnavazian dynasty, the kings, they control uh, the country, they control this really important uh, North Caucasian passes. But uh, I don't know. I don't know really what, what's happening. I, I, I would ask others to their opinion what's happening in the second, first century. But about the North Caucasian passage, like I would like to uh, speak about, like in Dar um example, like I think uh, the the crucial was to control this passage to protect the commonwealth, like empires from nor nomad nomads from the north, but. Um, it was never like long term control uh, in in Tariali, for instance, like. Uh, so Iberian kings uh, needed to have this like permanent control on the gorge, but it, it was never permanent. So North Caucasians, uh, they always managed to cross the mountains. For instance, like uh, during our expeditions, uh, we, we discovered some of these bone objects, which is published in our, in our book. And with these really beautiful carvings and stuff, and I, I found these parallels from the hazards, from the hazard worlds, and it's really, according to the C14 dates and uh, the historical picture, it really nicely corresponds that period when hazards managed to break this, uh, let's say, blocked uh, North Caucasian passes, and they attacked, um, like the <laughs> Arabs. So during their fights. So, and we see that archaeological materials, archaeological data reflects uh, this, um, pro even this really short term process. Maybe Hazard stayed at Darial Fort for a few months, but they left something behind, which helps us to like, identify what was happening on this North Caucasian passes. And I don't have much of information about Lazicus and West Georgia's uh, passes, but I could speak about Darial. But it certainly Thank seems so possible to, to say that um, part of what's going on there isn't always them attacking the settled people to the south. The, the locals very often invite them in. So uh, when the uh, in 459, the Albanian king Vace revolts against his Sasanian overlord, the first thing he does is he opens the pass of Tsur or Chor or Darbend, if you like, um, and he lets the um, uh, he lets the uh, Huns in. Or the Masagitai. Um, what the Sasanians do in, in response is they open the Darial Gorge and bring their own allies through. So these steppe nomads are being used by both sides uh, against each other. But very often you need somebody local on the ground to get you through, which is why I think the mention, um, which occurs so unusually in this period in Lazica, of subsidies being distributed amongst the mountain tribes and the tribes beyond the mountains is so important because it's those those local diplomatic relations that allow you to send people across the mountains to make further alliances with the military forces beyond and to, to bring them through. It's You build a network through these gifts and that I think was one of the interesting things about the discovery of plates and bowls and silverware in the, you know, in the north as well as in the south. Um, or for my period, you begin to find that um, uh, along with the plates and, and vessels that we get from the earlier period, you get um, uh, interesting um, church stuff. Some of it's church plate, but you also get Proconesian marbles being sort of distributed up and down the coasts of Abkhazia. Um, uh, and and uh, again, if you look at the Syriac uh, sources, you, you hear about missionaries being sent over the over the mountains to deal with the Allens. So again, I, there's a sort of complex network of things going on, most of which don't 
you know, they very rarely get mentioned in the sources that have survived. But on the odd occasion when we do get them, you think, gosh, that must have been going on throughout this period. We just don't have the sources for most of it. Sorry. Can I just toss one more relevant thing into this conversation, right? The ideological myths of both the Iberian and the Armenian, Armenian Hellenistic period aristocracies are, are, are predicated on a marriage between somebody from the North Caucasus and the South Caucasus. I mean, that's much later information. It's coming super complicated ways through the source tradition. But the idea that that is a, a, a relevant and salient piece of local constitutional political authority, such that it's completely logical that you found your dynasty by marrying or lassoing across the Aras a daughter of the North Caucasus, I think that that's an incredibly meaningful data point. Um, and it speaks very much to the story that we heard about at Olbia too. Um, and, and the thing is, we just, we don't know how to, we don't know how to see these people, right? We don't, we don't know what they look like materially. Um, and so we miss a tremendous amount of their presence in the South Caucasus. Um, and this also is, frankly, speaks to Jehun's presentation as well, um, which is to say that there's a ton of material from Gabala that, that is very clearly connected, not to this necessarily coastal Dagestani route, but to this mountain route through the mountains that, are, that Gabala is at the foot of. I mean, it's an incredibly logical thing if you get over the idea that nobody moves through the mountains. Yeah, I, Je, Jehun is gone. He, he's not here. I had a question for him and I forgot. Um, yeah, it went off the camera. Yeah, but but something does be about. Um, sorry. I didn't catch that answer. I was, I was going to, I was just thinking there was a, there was a, um, is it second century, is Lucian second century, end of second, mid, late second century, I think he, he, one of his stories involves a, um, uh, uh, is it a marriage between a Lars king and a, um, and a, uh, one of the kings of the Bosporus? Um, yeah, and Lucian is another, I mean, this is another great place for looking at precisely this from a, a knowledgeable cultural insider, broadly speaking, in how some of this stuff is working. Um, and and yeah, I mean, I think it is. I think it's a Bostern princess. I believe that that's the story. Um. In the Bostern kingdom, is you know, fr from its origin, it is a, a sort of fusion of, um, well, you know, Greek, potentially Thracian, and then eventually, if we you know use the term formation as well, uh, dynasts. You know, this dynasty, obviously, the earlier one. Um, being sort of from from the fourth century BC and coming down into uh, the Roman period as the Spartacies as well, uh, consistently, you know, if we just go on names, we're seeing names which are going from Greek to transliterations of Greek from Iranian names, and we have this sort of very interesting um, dual title of the Basileus and the Archon for the ruler, which sort of, again, speaks to sort of multiple audiences. We're looking at the Tamgas. These, I mean, those in the Bosphoran kingdom, the Tamgas, they kind of, to an extent, replace the actual name of the, of the ruler. Um, you know, you'll have Greek stelae and, and it'll have the Tamga on it as the sort of mark of the king. On um, you know, one side, it'll have the Tamga, on the other, it'll have the name very much uh, you know, lots of lots of interactions, and you know, even even as far afield as you know, Olbia, which is more broadly considered part of the sort of Western Pontic world, with a much closer connection um, to to sort of uh, the mainland of sort of Greece and, and Roman culture. Uh, even there, we're seeing you know not only Phasaurus and Menos, but actually in that second century BC that you talked about, we have another uh, potentially uh, Scythian. Um, ruler who's minting coins there, Scalorus, who is later buried in Neopolis on, on Crimea. Um, the precise nature of his control or lack thereof uh, in Albia itself is, is the sort of point of issue that I won't go into. But yeah, there's clearly something very interesting going on across this area that is both um, new, but also a sort of carrying on of, of traditions which have been there for, for many years, centuries. I actually was going to ask you a question, Lana, about the 
uh, altars and, and the horses knocking over the altars and just to, that seemed really fascinating but I wondered if it's do, do you do you believe it is it is it sort of more of a, a kind of fun interpretation or do, is there genuinely something there I think you're on mute is that, sorry Yeah, this is um, this is really interesting group of the vessels. Like they they come from different locations, and uh, sadly, some of them are preserved in uh, in in Russia in a state hermitage. So I, we do not have access, and we have really bad quality black and white photos from the uh, past century. Uh, but some are discovered uh, in Tsheta uh, and Suderi, and this makes this like big group of the vessels with the similar depictions in the center. And this is, um, uh, yeah, by Georgian scholars, this is considered to be like hidden, uh, I don't know how to say, hidden reaction of like um, refusing Zoroastrian and Sasanian side and uh, taking pro-Roman, pro-Western course in politics and also declaring Christianity. So it's like a hidden gesture that the horse is just kicking the altar slightly. And then the altar is uh, like, a, in one picture, a horse is just standing, and in the second one, his uh, his one uh, leg is lifted, so he's trying to kick. And in the third one, there is altar already moved from the vertical position, so it's like a series, you know. And it's really uh, really interesting. I think the. Um, when we say that they are locally produced and they reflect the uh, Georgians' uh, belief and uh, their views, um, we we need uh, to strengthen this um, assumption. We need some chemical analysis to be done on the silver, so we we can say for sure that they are made locally. But uh, I believe that they are made locally, and I believe that there is some hidden. Um, like in the beginning, they 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 had to uh, hide their belief and their Christianity. So in early Christian times, so these vessels could be this um, one of these kind of materials. No, yeah, well, I mean, if it, if it's uh, if it's true, then that is very interesting, as you say, sort of hidden insight into uh, and no other. Oh, hello, we've got a question in the chat. Um, but yes, it would be a sort of little glimpse. I, in in Pompeii, there's a, a I don't know if you know it. There's a sort of graffiti of um, the famous image of Aeneas carrying out uh, his father and his son from Troy. Is replaced. The heads are replaced with dogs' heads, and there's this idea that it's potentially a sort of like a a slight critique of the imperial propaganda that Augustus, you know, being the descendant is this great guy and this is the mockery. Just a, another little little hint at something, people thinking something a little bit different to the to the official line. Uh, David has asked, how far does this discussion cover the Albanian period in Azerbaijan and correlate to the political and cultural groups in Georgia and Armenia? Um, I don't know if we've uh, got anyone who wants to take that on straight away. Um, Perhaps we can even bring in the group of um, uh, Caucasus through time uh, on that. Uh, it, I feel like the Albanian period would have been more Jehun's uh, uh, remit, but um, if, if uh, uh, none of us feel... I, yep, no uh, We can forward your question to Jehun, David, if you're happy with that. So. Yeah. That might be a thing to do is give him an email and just see what uh, what his thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, my my question was if they had some silver vessels from this um, graves <laughs> <laughs> that they were like uh, there, there were like lots of materials. But yeah, I can email. I can ask you for his email later. And oh, um, I can email. Yeah. Well. I think we can probably draw this to a close and, and continue it via emails um, if, if need be. Uh, yeah, Nani, would you like to close yeah. proceedings? Nani? I, I just have um, just uh, very quickly to use this opportunity to meet all of you, uh, most of you for the first time. Uh, we, we do have some uh, archaeological international conferences in Georgia. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure 
that's where I met Lara for the first time. It's a Vardia conference and uh, it will be held in person in, in the beginning of June. And if you're interested, I can also email um, you know, to your um, email the, uh, about this conference. And this is already 12th year of this conference and there are mainly young archaeologists and also scholars like professors from the UK, like Austria, Italy. And this is uh, so something I would like to spread the information about. Maybe you will be interested and we can, you can uh, also participate at conference. Um, Okay, this is very, you can ask others who have been there, it's a, it's a really good conference and it helps Georgian archaeologists and not only Georgians to get involved in this like international projects, to start new projects, to bring your attention to something new you would like to work on in Georgia and not only in Georgia and the Caucasus and etc. So I will spread the word by email and then the guys can uh, pass you this information. Thank you. I, I can see Laura uh, nodding her head. Well, I think it's clearly a fun. Highly recommended. It's a wonderful, wonderful conference and a wonderful <laughs> opportunity to meet other scholars working in the space. Genuinely, everybody should really very much suggest to any early career scholars who they know to participate in this. It's great. Yeah. And it's a real testament Lovely. to wow. the archaeological community in Georgia that, that this thing is, has been running for so long. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. I don't have very much to say, really. Um, we really enjoyed and um, our heartfelt thanks goes to our speakers. And I personally really enjoyed and then learned about the period um, and fascinating talks. Um, yeah, and, uh, and thanks to everyone who joined um, uh, our audience who made it even more special and stayed until the end of the, our discussion. <laughs> uh, and I will pass to Gwen to, if you- uh, Thank you, thank you so much to all the speakers and to everyone who asked questions and uh, joined the discussion. Um, wish you a good new year. Um, hope to see you in our events next term. Um, if any of you ever want to give a talk or have a specific topic in mind uh, that you want to present in our network, then please get in touch with us. I'll put the email in the chat again. Um, yeah, I hope you have a restful break um, over the Christmas time. And um, yeah. And keep safe from yeah. this new virus. <laughs> Thank you for helping with the presentation, Gwen. Yeah, no worries at all. Happy Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone from Georgia. Happy Christmas. Thanks.